Hello and welcome <coughs> to this first look exploring session, our final session, looking at If You Know Not Me, You Know Nobody, uh, part two. Uh, though I don't think really you can sensibly call it part two. It's a part in a, of its own self. And in fact, it doesn't make any sense as a turn of phrase unless you're Hobson. Uh, the wonderful Hobson, who uh, a, a character that we've come to know and love, uh, uh, who's uh, appeared in the first three sessions of this play and who now has completely dropped off the grid. Um, as a spoiler alert for everyone as we do the final scenes of this play, uh, there is no um, character speech prefix as far as I can find for him. So um, we're all a bit sad before we even start reading the final scenes mm. of this play. Uh, as we shift focus, we've started shifting focus away from our uh, sort of city people to a more court focused uh, element but uh, we've still got some tidying up to do lots of questions about the dramaturgy of this and also lots of textual questions as we're going to be reading the final scene twice in two slightly different versions uh, when we get to it uh, so there are all sorts of editorial questions that uh, we we might ask about what to do with this play uh, as and when we stage it uh, joining uh, the room for this exciting uh, closing session uh, reading uh, Pedro Hunston and possibly some other things as well as we go is... Hi, I'm Eric and I am some of the things as well. <laughs> uh, reading Medina and Drake today is... Hello, my name is Lynn Freitas. I am a teacher during the academic year and uh, I'm coming to you from the northwestern United States. Uh, reading a, a creditor and the queen is hello i'm helen good i'm a historian and i'm in hull uh, reading another creditor and lester is rachel actor on the east coast uh, reading john john gresham and captain is hi i'm lois a retired academic in london uh, reading Dr. Noel and uh, a post is. Hi, my name's Elizabeth Amisu and I'm an author based in Romford. Uh, reading Chorus, recalled us and post number two is. Hi, Alan in the east of England. Uh, <laughs> and I'm your host, Robert Crichton. Uh, we may have some additional uh, people popping in. Uh, we shall see. And as I say, some of these parts may move around as uh, as we go on the fly. I will be reading stage directions and hopefully won't be reading any parts as we go. Uh, we're going to go into the, uh, the play from scene 17 as uh, we have it numbered. Uh, some numbering systems do vary. Uh, and uh, in a moment, we'll have the entrance of Jack... Gresham, John, uh, we're going to have some creditors turning up. Uh, I'm going to ask Eric, could you step in to be a lady uh, coming up? That would be lovely. And we'll see how far we get. So scene 17, uh, John has been doing some dastardly things um, in uh, in previous scenes. So uh, we're going to see what, what he's up to now as he has opens the scene 17 with quite a long speech. <laughs> hey, Sfoot, Jack. Hold on thy resolution. They say that may happen in one hour, that happens not again in seven year. And I should chance to take her in the right vein, and I'll kindly bestow herself upon me. Why, then there's a man made from nothing. For before God, I have spent all not worth anything. <laughs> and indeed, unless this same good old Lady Ramsay takes some pity upon me and take me for better, for worse. God knows which of the two counters I shall keep my next Christmas in. But by this hand, if she will accept of me in this miserable estate that I am in now, uh, for before God, I have neither money nor credit, as I am an honest man, and that's more, I'm afeard that any man will believe of me. Uh, I'll forswear all women but her and will not kiss any of my neighbor's wives for a kingdom. <sighs> Here's the house. I'll knock at the door. Come on. Shall I do it in the cavalier humor with uh, who's within there, ho? Oh. Or in the Puritan humor with uh, by or leave, good brother? Faith, in neither. For in the one I shall be taken for a swaggering knave and in the other to be a hypocritical fool. But honest Jack, in thine own honest humor, plain dealing's a jewel, and I have used it so long, I am 
next door to a beggar. Enter two creditors. Oh, that's precious. What a plague make these here. These two are two of my creditors. I must stop their mouths, fleet them from hence, or all the fat's in the fire. Master Gresham, you are well met. I hope, gentlemen, you will say so anon. Uh, but you are uh, alone, are you not? Alone, Master Gresham? Why do you ask? Oh, a man hath reason to ask, being as I am, that never seeth his creditors, but is afraid of the uh, catchpole. But you are kind, my friends, and I thank you. You will bear with me. Aye, but Master Gresham, a man may bear till his back break. Aye, porters may, but you that are substantial, honest citizens, there's no fear to be made of your breaking. Uh, you know there's no man so low, but God can raise him. And though I am now out of heels, or so as you think, I am in the way of preferment and hope to be able to pay every man within this hour. We should be glad to see it. But how, pray, sir? Uh, how? Why, very easily, uh, if I can compass it. Uh, the truth is, though you would little think it, I am suitor for my lady Ramsay. But I dare swear she's no suitor to you. Enter Lady Ramsay and Dr. Noel. Uh, why, that's true, too. For if she were a suitor to me, we should be man and wife straight, and you should have your money within this half hour. Ah, but look, look where she comes. As you are good men, mum, patience and pray for my proceedings. If I do speed, as I am partly persuaded, you shall have your own, with the advantage. If I should be crossed, you know the worst, forbearance is no acquittance. But mum, if it prove a match, and if any of you should chance to be in the counter, you know, my marriage being spread, my word will be current. Then, mum. Madam. You are welcome into Lombard Street. I thank your courtesy, good Master Dean. Ah, see how fortunately all things chance. If it happen, as I hope it will, she taking a liking to me, here is a priest to marry us presently. Uh, madam. Would you any business with me, sir? Uh, faith, lady, necessary business, and not to go far about the bush, I am come to be a suitor unto you. And you know the fashion of young men, when they come a-wooing to ancient widows, the way to speed is to begin thus. Uh, you are very forward, sir. <laughs> you would say so, lady, if you knew how forward I would be. <laughs> but, madam, you are rich, and by my truth, I am very poor. And I have been, as a man should say, <laughs> stark naught. But he goes far that never turns. And if now I have a desire to mend and being in so good a way, you know how uncharitable it were in you to put me out of it. You may make an honest man of me if it please you. And when thou hast made me one by my troth, Mal, I'll keep myself. For I am a gentleman both by the father's side and mother's side. And though I have not the muck of the world, I have a great deal of good love. And I prithee, Accept of it. Master Dean, do you know this gentleman's business to me? <laughs> Not I, believe me, madam. Sure. Uh, why, I'll tell you, sir. Uh, my lady here is a comely, ancient, rich widow, and I am an honest, proper, poor young man, uh, remembering still I am a gentleman. Now, what good her riches may do to my poverty, your gravity may guess. Save a soul, perhaps, Master Dean. Uh, look you, sir, it is but giving my hand into hers and hers into mine. Uh, Master Dean, I protest before God she hath my heart already, and with some three or four words, which I know you have by rote, make us two, my lady and I, one, till death us do depart. This gentleman thinks that to be a matter of nothing. But do you love me as you do protest? Love you, madam, love you by this hand. I shall have her, sure. Uh, friends, you, you see how the business goes forward. Bring me your bills tomorrow morning, or upon the hope that I have, you may leave them with me. I shall be able to discharge. <laughs> Jack. <laughs> uh, how will you maintain me, sir, if I should marry you? 
maintain <laughs> what needed thou ask that question <laughs> so what thou had maintenance enough for thee and i too if i should marry you friend you see how it goes now um tomorrow uh tomorrow within an hour after i am married i must take the upper hand of my uncle and the next sunday i that was scarce worthy to sit in the belfry the church wardens fetch me in, seat me in the chancel. Master Dean, I protest, never since I was widowed, never did man make so much love to me. Sir, for your love, I am much beholding to you. Ah, de, de Mal, prithee, do not think it so. Uh, be chosen one of the co common council or one of the masters of the hospital, so perhaps I shall never become it. Mary, if I should be chosen one of the masters of Bridewell, or some of my old acquaintance foot, I would take it upon me. Vice must be corrected, vice must be corrected. Fill me a large cup full of hippograss and bring me hither 20 pounds in gold. And one of your husband's livery gowns. So now you trouble yourself so much that gold is to contract us with all. Um, a simple morning. Friends, you cannot beat me down with your bills. A master dean of Paul's, I pray you stay and dine with me. You shall not say me nay. The oftener you come, the more welcome. You are merry, sir. <laughs> I thank God, and all the world may see I have no other cause <laughs> that I am likely to be so well bestowed. Uh, sir, you shall not say the love you showed to me was entertained, but with kind courtesy. This, for your love unto your health, I drink. Pledge me. Aye, by my troth, Maul, will I, were it as deep as a well. Now for your pains, there is twenty pound in gold. Nay, take the cup too, sir. <laughs> Thanks for your love, and were my thoughts bent unto marriage, I rather would with you that seemed thus wild than with one with, that hath worse thoughts and seems more mild. What, will you not have me then? <laughs> yes, when I mean to marry anyone, and that not whilst I live. Oh, see how a man may be deceived. I thought I should have been sure by this time. Well, though I shall not have you, I shall have this with a good will. With all my heart, and for the love you have shown, wish it to thrive with you, even as mine own. Tomorrow shall we attend your worship. Sir, here's my bill. It comes to 20 pound. A friend, Plowden's proverb, the case is altered. And by my troth, I have learned you a lesson. Forbearance is no acquittance. <clears throat> what men are these? Uh, faith, madam, men that have my hand, though not for my honesty, yet for the money that I owe them. What doth he owe you? Fifty pound, madam. And what you? A hundred marks. <laughs> I'll pay you both. And, sir, to do you good, to all your creditors, I'll do the like. Oh, that's said like a kind wench. And though we never meet again, we'll have one bus more at parting. And now, if faith, I have all my wild oats sown. And if I can grow rich by help of this, I'll say I rose by Lady Ramsay's kiss. And they exit. Okay, there's an interesting scene to unpack, uh, especially considering the scene that we had earlier on the continent with uh, John and this 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 uh, question of ex of of these kind of pecuniary exchanges in association with love, um, or or the sort of the the yeah, what's going on here? Why is any of this stuff happening, <laughs> Lynn? Okay, yeah, more questions. Yeah, like, what's happening? Why would she do that? Another smaller point, creditor number two tells John, you owe me 20 pounds. And then uh, he tells Lady Ramsay, he uh, he owes me 100 marks, which huh? is, and marks, a, a, mar a mark is a larger denomination. No, than a, no, 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 he's, he, if... A mark wasn't a coin, it was right. a value. If there are circumstances under which 50, uh, 50 marks and 20 pounds could be rough equivalents, okay. it would be well, unusual, but it is possible. I'm not entirely sure exactly what's going on there. 
Mm. Yeah, um, why, think, why would he express it I, in Marx rather well, than... The... I think Marx is probably what the debt is in, but the reason he says £20, well, how much has she given him? £20. Just 20 yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> that's why he says the first time, Oi, that 20 quid's mine. Yeah, he basically just goes, yoink. Um... <laughs> yes. So, I mean, the, uh, it's perfectly possible that, that debts were quite often expressed in marks, but you couldn't pay anyone in marks because it wasn't a coin. Mm. Uh, Alan? The thing that rang completely false to me, apart from the fact that John is just a total pathological liar, um, is that previous times we've seen a Lady Ramsey has apparently appeared to be quite sensible with her head screwed on. And suddenly, having been widowed, she's suddenly gone completely librarian. I, I, uh, Lois? No, I think she's behaving uh, quite sensibly, actually. I mean, she turns him down, after all. I mean, she's not like a lot of the widows in comedy who do actually fall for the, uh, the young rake. I mean, it's astonishing how often that happens. Uh, Chapman's *The Widow's Tears*, for example, is a uh, is a play where that exactly that story. Uh, no, and and in fact, she's been talked. Of, she asked early in the play about whether the great benefactors of London included any women, and uh, her husband has just died and left her a lot of money. And she's being, I think, she's doing pretty much what Hobson did, only on a different to a different person. I mean, a different kind of person. That is trying. I mean, he does say right at the end that she will have raised him and Hobson raised John Tawnycoat uh, by uh, giving him money at a crucial moment. Uh, I think it's a fairly sensible thing. I mean, she's still falling for this idea that they all have that wild young men become wonderful people later on. Maybe they do. I don't know. But, uh, you know, at this particular guy, it seems highly unlikely. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is I I, I like the courtesan that we had yesterday there's no sense that she is being taken in by anything that he's saying mm. per se but it, it, it's it's one of these sort of origin myth things that he's sort of concocting as he's as he's enacting it you know uh that that she's going to effectively set him up for his mm. next stage as as a as a benefactor mm. um uh i'm not quite sure having met him why she would do that that's my only real problem beyond the fact that maybe this is based on some story and therefore that's just what has to happen yeah. uh and and that sort of the one of the problems with uh, plays that intersect with history is sometimes you can't quite psychologically marry the story with mm. what a character can do yeah. i'll go to helen then eric then lynn i got the impression that she's amused by him mm. Mm. yeah i think so i mean yeah. She really, really is amused by his audacity. Uh, yeah, well, it is pretty funny, isn't it? I mean, some guy yeah. she barely knows turning up and, you know, talking as if, of, of course, he'll, she'll, uh, you know, he's behaving like uh, like a, a gallant who, who's known her for years. And I don't know, it's the whole thing is absurd. Yes, and, and, uh, and he is, he is, I mean, he, she gives him a lot but I think it's payment for amusing her. Mm -hmm. uh, Eric? Um, two things. I just like how he, John just goes, yeah, I'm going to marry you for the money. That's not, let's not kid ourselves here. <laughs> um, and also, um, I, I think she's actually th just throwing money at the problem to make him go away. I don't know if that's just me, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it, it also, it, it, you know, on a structural thing, you know, the point of the scene is this sort of comedy business of, ah, uh, here are some creditors and here is the thing. And he's going to try and get the money live from from somebody else, uh, but without, uh, but while trying to save face by doing all these asides about, you know, I'm going to marry her. It's all going to, uh, and, and of course, it doesn't go down as he's planned, but he still comes out the other end quite well. And it's it, with John, it's constantly this game of dancing. He's constantly dancing his way through a scene. He has no idea how he's going to get to the end of a scene. Um, but somehow he's going to talk everybody round. And, and he sort of does. I mean, we've got a few characters who do similar things like that in this play. Lynn. Yeah, well, it, 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 it's, it's sort of the, the expiration on my... Um, comment has passed because I was going to respond to, you know, she doesn't fall for it. There's kind of nothing 
to fall for because he doesn't really lie to her. He mm. doesn't say, oh, I love you. I think you're beautiful. <laughs> you're not old. Too. You're not old. No, he calls her ancient, which doesn't mean like super old like it does now. The, the meaning of that word has shifted. It, it doesn't necessarily mean extremely old, but it does mean older. Uh, so he says, you're rich. I'm young and handsome. Let's 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 work it out. We can ha we can have a bargain. Uh, and and I do love you, but he doesn't prioritize that. He's really very upfront about what his mm -hmm. motives are, and maybe that's part of it. She because you know someone was to, Lois or Eric was just saying she's she's kind of amused by it. She's probably mm -hmm. you know impressed by his frankness. Like okay, mm -hmm. yeah, that's not the bargain that we're gonna make. But I appreciate your being upfront about it. Here's some money to get you back on your feet. Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. uh, other thoughts um, Eric I just had this brainwave while Lynn was talking it's very much what the queen does with Hobson where like sort of um, yeah she, she just kind of plays along uh, <laughs> yeah. please just smile and nod and like make the problem go away somehow yeah it's yeah. the same thing he's impudent as well I mean perhaps yeah. not intentionally John is certainly intentionally impudent uh, <sighs> Mm. Yeah, and I don't think either of the scenes is actually saying this is the way to behave to women and you'll get everything you want, but at least it's saying, uh, you know, they'll pay you to go away or something. <laughs> yeah. uh, an interesting system. Uh, uh, Eric? <laughs> I, mean, I have a question, though. Like, what, does John actually think himself honest or is he just describing himself as honest? Because, like, he kind of goes, you know, he's, he repeats it a lot of times when he's by himself. So he could be lying to the audience and stuff, but I'm like, yeah, that's it. it's just yeah, an yeah, well, interesting thought. I mean, uh, honest is a funny word, and there, there, are, I think uh, there's a book called The Structure of Complex Words, which discusses the meaning of the word honest, and particularly in a famous play where a character is referred to as honest quite a lot of the time. Oh, I feel a borderline. Yes, yes, short leash there, short leash, yeah, uh, yeah. Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking about the character of John and how he's also called Jack. Um, and I think I was thinking about that the word because at the beginning it says um, enter Jack Gresham. Um, and I was just thinking as, of, of him as a character um, to being like Jack the lad and being very laddish. Um, and I was just thinking about this idea that is he a harmful character or is he harmless? And I was wondering that like, he's always on this borderline of like some of the things he's asking for are above and beyond. I think he's asking for more than he should. Um, and um, I was just wondering in terms of gender politics, you know, in terms of gender, what what kind of character is he we did a knack to know a knave and i think that he's very much a knave type character um and although lady ramsey kind of ameliorates what he says she could be quite offended by him hmm. uh what well, uh i mean uh as far as jack and john they are basically uh interchangeable um okay there, there's 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 a line in the importance of being earnest about you know one one being a, a, a domesticity no, of the other no, um, domesticity. yeah um <laughs> that's why everyone line. wants to be wants uh their, their uh, spouse to be named earnest um because <laughs> of the awfulness of the name um but actually in terms of actually what he's like uh yes in yesterday's session which you missed he was pretty horrid at mm. one point um mm. so yeah, there's this borderline between knavishness, which is just a bit of fun, to actively blackmailing someone, uh, which is what he did yesterday. Um, so, yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, I'll go to Lois, then Rachel. Lots of hands going up. Yeah. Well, also, we, we've never really found out. But if if what they said in that earlier scene was true, he's he's turned Timothy in and is largely responsible for him being about to be hanged. And we still don't know what happened about that. And we may never find out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Helen. I was going to say exactly the same thing. Mm. Uh, yeah. Rachel. Now, um, I was going to say to Elizabeth's point, I think there is 
she does have something there in terms of characterization. Um, you know, how the creditors are calling him um, Master Gresham, that it has something to do with, it has to do with the way that we're naming people and the way that we talk about people. Um, uh, has something to do with status and sometimes it has to do with intimacy and jack being that nickname if somebody's calling him that they have that intimacy where um you know it's like how uh our higher status characters will go in verse but you know sometimes our lower status characters will talk all in prose that it's kind of playing um that game and putting it into the writing to um play with so i i think there might be some some play with the character's identity there hmm. uh okay uh any more for any more otherwise we we'll, we will go on because we have a bit of a a, <clears throat> a, a a chorus turns up Enter chorus um, uh, 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 for reasons we'll discuss later on. Uh, but anyway, scene 18, as we're calling it, enter chorus. From 58, the first year of her reign, we come to 88 and of her reign, the 30th year. This queen inaugurated and strongly planted in her people's hearts was in her youth solicited in marriage by many princely heirs of Christendom, especially by Philip. King of Spain, her sister's husband, who, to achieve his ends, had got a dispensation from the Pope. But after many treats and embassies, finding his hopes in her were quite frustrated, aims all his stratagems, plots and designs, both to the utter ruin of our land and our religion. But the undaunted Queen, fearing no threats, but willing to strike first, sends forth a fleet of one and twenty sail to the West Indies under the conduct of Francis Drake and Christopher Carlyle, who set on Cape Verde, then Hispaniola, setting on fire the towns of St Anthony and St Dominic. The proud Spaniard, enraged at this affront, sends forth a fleet, three whole years in preparing to subject, ruin and quite depopulate this land. Imagine now you see them under sail, swelled up with many a proud, vainglorious boast, and newly entered in our English coast. So, uh, stuff's happening. Stuff. The uh, chorus comes on and says, "History's going on over there." Never mind all this uh, getting, get ex extracting money from people. Uh, history's going on. Um, yeah. Um, th any thoughts uh, about history? Uh, Helen. Yeah, it's not about history. It's just that this is an excellent bridge from the end of part one <laughs> to the end of part two. Yeah, it it it, it isn't it's it just a perfect bridge. It it's where we left off. You know, Philip and Mary. Uh, you know, Philip was still sort of around, and this explicitly is talking about him again, and that 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 you know suggestion of him trying to uh to marry uh, elizabeth as well and uh, and this all going horribly a uh, different direction and yeah there's something really really yeah feels like it's 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 from somewhere else uh lois you are muted at present then lynn or maybe i'll do it the other way around lynn while uh, while we sort out muting <laughs> Um, I, I, I love how this chorus frames the, the armada. It, it, it kind of hints that it's not really military or political so much as the revenge of a disappointed lover. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't outright say that, but that's kind of hinted at. Mm. She yeah. wouldn't marry him, so he sent the armada. <laughs> Ooh, boy, yeah. that's stalkery. <laughs> yeah, uh, Lois. Yeah, and uh, it really fits in rather... Although it may link well with part one, it also links rather well with the previous scene where we've got one woman's way of dealing with an unwanted suitor. And then, uh, and the queen has also got suitors. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other thoughts? Um, obviously, quite a short prologue. Um, uh, so prologue, chorus, um, thing. Um, uh, yeah, we'll... Uh, 
we'll move on then uh, to uh, into what it's semi-describing. I'll ask uh, Elizabeth, uh, you're not currently in this scene, could I ask you to read a Spaniard coming up, please? Okay. Lovely. Uh, otherwise, I think we have all the bodies in place. I could be wrong. Uh, we'll see. Uh, so, uh, scene 19, enter the Duke of Medina, Don Pedro, uh, John Martinus Recordus, and other Spaniards. We are where we long wish to be at last. And now this elephant's burden, our armado, three years in embryon, is at length produced and brought into the world to live at sea. Non suficit orbis, our proud Spanish motto by the England mocked and found at Carthagen, shall it not now take force? Can England satisfy our avarice? The world cannot suffice. What thinks Don Pedro? Alfonso's Perez Guzman, the Duke of Medina and Sidonia, and Royal General of our great armada. I think we come too strong. What's our design against the petty island governed by a woman? I think instead of military men garnished with arms and martial discipline, she with the feminine train of her bright ladies, beautifulest and best, will meet us in their smocks, willing to pay their maidenheads for a ransom. <laughs> Thinks thou so, Don Pedro. I therein am confident and partly sorry that our King of Spain hath been at charge of such a magazine when half our men and ammunition might have been spared. Thou puttest me now in mind of our Grand Signor, who, for some years since, when, as the great ambassador of Spain importuned him for aid against the land, styled by the title of the Maiden Isle, calls for a map, and now... When the ambassador has showed him the Indies, all America, some parts of Asia, and Europa too, climbs that took up the greatest part of the card, and finding England but a spot of earth, or a few acres of it all, compared to our so large and spacious provinces, denies him aid, as much against his honor to fight with such a centuple of odds, but gave him this advice. Were I, said he, as your great king of Spain, out of my kingdoms, I'd press or hire so many pioneers as with their spades and mattocks should dig up this wart of earth and cast it into the sea. And well, methought he spake. We have shown ourselves, but are as yet unfought with. All our hearts are dead within him. We, I fear, all their hearts are dead within them. We, I fear, shall find the sea unguarded and the shores unmanned and conquer without battle. All their honours and offices we have disposed already. There's not a noble family in Spain, in Naples, Portugal, nay Italy, that hath not in our fleet some eminent person to share in this rich beauty. John Martinez recalled this as your, you, our prime navigator, since famed Columbus and great Magellan gave us a, a brief relation of the strength and potency of this, our great armado, christened by the Pope, the Navy Invincible. Twelve mighty galleons of Portugal, 14 great ships of Biscay, of Castile, 11 tall ships, of Andalusia, 16 galleons, 14 of Grispo, 10 sail that run by the name of the Eastern Fleet, the ships of Urcas, Zybras, Naples, Galleys, Great Galleasses, flyboats, pinnaces, amounting to the number of 130 tight tall sail, and most of them seeming like castles built upon the sea. And what can all their barges, cockboats, oars, small vessels, better to be said to creep than to sail upon the ocean, do against these? They are overcome already. All their burdens, 57,865 ton. In them, 19,295 soldiers, 2,808 galley slaves. 8,650 mariners, 2,630 piece of ordnance, culverin and cannon. Half these would suffice, 
nor have we need of such surplusage against their petty flyboats. Enter a Spaniard. We have discovered, riding along the coasts of France and Dunkirk, an English navy. Of what strength, what force? Their number small, yet daring, as it seems. Their ships are but low built, yet swift of sail. Whether their purpose be to fight, I know not. They bear up bravely with us. Past our fleet into a wide and semicircled moon, and if we can but once encompass them, we'll make the sea their graves, and themselves food for the sea worm called Haddock. Let's sail on towards the Thames mouth and there a disburden us of our land soldiers. And if the Prince of Parma keep his appointment, who with a thousand able men at arms, old soldiers and most approved discipline, uh, lies garrisoned at Dunkirk, we at once will swallow up their nation and our word be from henceforth Victoria. Victoria! 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 And they exit apart from Medina. Had we no other forces in our fleet, nor men, nor arms, nor ammunition, powder, nor ordnance, but our empty bottoms, ballast with the Pope's blessing, and our navy christened by him, the navy invincible, we had enough. And there's more unnecessary, nor think we threaten England all in vain, tis ours. And we here christen it New Spain. Victoria! 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 Victoria. That's Victoria. probably where the exuant actually lives. Uh, so, wow, our boats are bigger than theirs. Look at our massive boats. Yeah, we've got huge, huge boats. Huge. <laughs> yeah, they've just got little boats, little boats. But, uh, but the, 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 the uh, sailor who comes on the Spaniard is going, oh, but they're really small. They're nippy. They're nippy. Um, Actually, you know, the basis of this is, is reasonably solid. Um, uh, it's got some actually solid stuff. I mean, apart from just the, the pure jingoism just being <laughs> shoveled on here. Just just so unsubtle. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the whole thing about the, the, the semicircled moon and, and uh, as a formation uh, and, and, you know, the, yeah. the, the way yeah. there's, there's a lot of solid detail has actually been put into this. Yeah, um, I mean, Lynn, then Helen. Yeah, the the... Um, some of the English boats were actually named things like the Defiant. So, yeah, small but scrappy. I, I mean, that's kind of how it was with these giant land castles, like sea castles, full of foot soldiers, because the old way of doing sea battle was you grappled and then you fought like a land, as if it were a land battle. But the English ships were faster mm. than the Spanish ships. They would actually have had to cooperate with their own def in their own defeat. It's like they're not going to grapple with you. They're going to shoot at you with their superior cannons and harass you until the weather takes you out. Dudes. Yeah, because uh, I, th I, th I think it was the case that the, the, the cannons were, were not as necessarily as big, but they were faster to reload and slightly more accurate. So they, right. they, they were, were able to get more punches instead of, in. Um, instead of brass, the, the uh, Spanish was still using brass cannons, which failed more readily and had needed more time to cool. And it's very easy to lose track in the heat of battle, which cannons are ready to reload. And there was a lot of cell phones. There was a lot of, uh, of cannons failing and, and, and damaging and, and destroying the Spanish ships because they lost track of which ones were cooled sufficiently to, uh, to use again. So yeah, yeah. I mean, it was basically, it's kind of, um, having cool all over again, it's, uh, it's superior technology. Mm. And the way this, this scene is also playing it is that there's so much pride here. You know, our stuff's great. It's going to be, we're going to wipe the floor with them and then, you know, becoming yeah. the floor of all. Helen. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't say that anything that's just been said isn't true, but in fact, the, the thing that killed the Armada was that they didn't have a workable plan. They were supposed to pick up Palmer's army and deliver it to Margate. Uh -huh. And this was never going to work. Mm. Everybody knew it wasn't going to work. And they kept on passing really good landing points on the south coast and but they had their orders. Had but, they gone ashore and taken, for example, the Isle of Wight, and had the Spanish mm -hmm. Tercios actually managed to land, 
Um, I mean, it was it would have been a bit like the Home Guard in the Second World War. They reckoned that the entire Home Guard would hold the German army up by about 30 minutes. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's, it's thing, the plan was just fundamentally far the, too complicated. It was the plan. It was far I mean, too I mean, I mean the, the, the English <laughs> ran out of powder hmm. very early on. And plus oh. weather and other um, things. Yeah, um, yeah. Anyway, we, we anyway should, that, let's not get too distracted irrelevant. on this stuff. Let's talk about what this play is doing. Uh, Elizabeth. Yeah. Um, just to add on to that, wasn't it Griezmann who was just not up to scratch? Because they talk about him in the text, and and I just for for what I remember Ooh. is that Griezmann wasn't really suited for the job for leading the Armada. Who who? Uh, the, who's uh, it's, no, um, it's um, uh, Alphonsus. It is, uh, it is in fact um Medina. Oh, hmm. Medina, the Duke of Medina. Sidonia, yeah, the Medina Sidonia. The the guy who was supposed to command it died oh. in, inconveniently. And he really? was a, he was a substitute and he begged the king not to send him because he it, said yeah. he was absolute he had no experience of sea warfare at all. Had and never he, been to sea. Yeah. He'd never been on a boat. Yeah, and, and and but but of course when you put your entire faith in the Almighty, <laughs> uh, things can go slightly wrong. Uh, yeah. Anyway, um, back yeah. to the play. Uh, so yes. um, uh, you know, it's it's a, it's a slightly problematic scene. It's uh, it, it's sort of uh, it's sort of enjoyable in in certain ways, but it, you know, it's laying things on with a trowel. Um, yeah. You know, it is. Dig up this wart of earth, um, uh, you know, and the the, the sea worm called Haddock. And they're um, to their own <laughs> avarice. I mean, but it's, it's, avarice. it's interesting to know, though, I think it, it sort of increases your in, enjoyment or it makes that a, a, a different experience when you know how, to what an extent, the defeat of the Armada was due to dumb luck. Um, and this play is spinning it as so providential, you know, so... It, that's just sort of amusing for for us from this perspective like yeah that's what that's what historiography does is it spins a narrative that doesn't necessarily take everything into account <laughs> yeah but god's providence and dumb luck it's very mm. difficult to tell the mm. difference yeah. mm -hmm. and you know and obviously elizabeth spun spun the uh, armada uh, for all it was worth um in all sorts oh, of Oh she was the spin mistress yeah yeah uh eric I was going to say, this is a bit like the sort of equivalent of the, you know, French in the castle scene <laughs> from uh, Monty Python. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah, sort uh, of with the cow yeah. and stuff. Yeah. yeah. But, like, obviously, they, they sort of managed to, you know, keep out the invaders, whereas here yeah. it's the opposite. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna move on to scene twenty uh, as we've got it numbered here. Uh, this scene diverges. Uh, there are uh, two different, fundamentally different versions of uh, of the text, um, which diverge in quite radical ways. We've decided not to try and pass this too too finely, uh, so we're going to allow one to speak for itself and then another, broadly speaking, to speak for itself. There may be some contradictions or some th problems with uh, each version. Uh, it starts with the opening of the scene, which is pretty much the same in both, and then you will hear the sound of a bell. Um, I will indicate when we go to our first diversion point. We'll get to the end of the play as it stands in its earlier form, and uh, then we will rejoin it again uh, after a little chat uh, with the later version. So uh, don't worry too much if something feels contradictory or weird. Um, we're not trying to uh, to uh, solve that particular uh, thread yet. That's grist for the mill uh, later on in this uh, session. Scene 20, drum and colours. Um, enter... Oh, I was just going to say, who's... Uh, uh, Alan... Uh, not Alan, uh, Lois, could I ask you to read in uh, Sir Anthony, please? It's only a couple of lines that turn up in a mo, uh, and then I don't think ever says anything ever again. Um, uh, so, scene 20, uh, drum and colours. Enter the Earl of Leicester, the Earl of Hunsdon, bearing the standard. Queen Elizabeth, completely armed, and soldiers. A stamp. From London, thus far have we marched... 
Here, pitch our tents. How do you call this place? The town you see to whom these downs belong gives them to name the plains of Tilbury. Be this then styled our camp at Tilbury, and the first place we have seen in arms or thus accoutred. Here we fix our foot not to stir back, where we sure here to encounter with all the Spanish vengeance threatened us, came it in fire and thunder. No, my subjects, your queen hath now put on a masculine spirit to tell the bold and daring what they are or what they ought to be, and such as fate teach them by my example fortitude. Nor let the best proved soldier here disdain a woman should conduct a host of men to their disgrace or want of precedent. Have you not read of brave Zenobia? an Eastern queen who faced the Roman legions, even in their pride and height of potency, and in the field encountered personally Aurelianus Caesar. Think in me her spirit survives, queen of this Western Isle, to make the scorned name of Elizabeth as frightful and as terrible to Spain as was Zenobia's to the state of Rome. Oh, I could wish them landed and in view to bid them instant battle ere march further into my land. This is my vow, my rest. I'll pay their way with this my virgin breast. But Madame, ere that day come, there will be many a bloody nose, I and cracked crown. We shall make work for surgeons. I hope so, Lester. For you, Sir Anthony, though your religion and recusancy might in these dangerous and suspicious times have drawn your loyalty into suspect, yet have you herein amply cleared yourself by bringing us 500 men well armed and your own self in person. Not only those, but all that I enjoy are at your highness service. Now, Lord Hunston, the Lord Lieutenant of our force by land, under our General Leicester. What thinkst thou of their armado, christened by the Pope, the Navy Invincible? That there's a power above both them and us that can their proud and haughty menaces convert to their own ruins. Thinkst thou so, Hunston? No doubt it will. Let me better survey my camp, some wine there. A health to all my soldiers. Flourish of trumpets. <laughs> Methinks I do not see amongst all my troops one with a courtier's face, but all look soldier-like. And here we start to get diversions. There is a peal of shot within. Whence came this sound of shot? Please it, your majesty, tis thought the fleet la lately discovered by your subject Flemings, riding along the coasts of France and Dunkirk, is met and fought with by your admiral. Oh, heaven prosper his proceedings. Hark, my lord, still it increaseth. Oh, had God and nature given us proportion manlike to our mind, we'd not stand here, fenced in a wall of arms but have been present in these sea alarms. Your royal resolution hath created new spirits in our soldiers' breasts, and made of one man three. Enter a post. Make way there. What's the news? Your royal fleet bids battle to the Spaniards, whose number with the advantage of the wind gives them great odds. But the undaunted worth and well-known valour of your admiral, Sir Francis Drake, and Martin Furbisher, gives us assured hope of victory. Where did the Royal Navy's first encounter? From Dover Cliffs we might discern them join, but such a cloud of smoke environed them, we could discover naught of their proceedings. For the great Spanish fleet had wind and tide, God and good heart stand on your grace's side. There's for thy news. He that first lent me breath, stand in the right of wronged Elizabeth. 
God and his angels. God and his angels for Elizabeth. For Elizabeth. God and his angels for Elizabeth. Excellent. Uh, Enter another post. Welcome, a God's name. What's the news, my friend? Alas, good man, his looks speak for his tongue. How stands the sea fight? Most contrarious. The Spanish fleet cast in a warlike rank, like a half moon or to a full bent bow. Wait for advantage, when among the rest, Sir Martin Furbisher, blinded with smoke and fired in heart with emulating honour, gave the proud Spaniard a broadside of shot. But being with the compass, within the compass of their danger, the distant core of their crippled fleet circled him round. This valiant Furbisher, with all his brave and gallant followers, are folded in death's arms. Oh, if he survive, he shall be nobly ransomed. If he die, he lives an honour to his nation. How fares our admiral? Bravely he fright, fights, directs with judgment and with heedful care, offends the foe. England ne'er bred men that a sea fight better managed. It cheers my blood, and if my God be pleased for some neglected duty in ourselves to punish us with loss of them at sea, his will be done. Yet will we pray for them if they return. Ourselves will be the first to bid them welcome. What says valiant Lester? Thou wilt not leave me, wilt thou? Dost thou look pale? What says old Hunston? Nay, he speak thy part. Thy hand, O Lord, I'm sure I have thy heart. Both hand and heart. A noise within crying, a furbisher, a furbisher. Enter a captain. Then let both heart and hand be bravely used in honour of our land. Before thou speak'st, take that. If he dead, a queen will see his funeral honoured. Had grasped his ships within a steely girdle, the valiant captain overcharged with her, having no room for cowardice or fear, gave all his ordnance a gallant charge, cheered up his soldiers, manned up his figlets, and standing barehead, bravely on deck, when dangerous shot, as thick as April hail, dropped by his ears, he waved his warlike sword, and with a bold defiance. <laughs> And with a bold defiance to the foe, the watchword given, his ordnance let fly with such a fury that it broke their ranks, shattered their sides, and made their warlike ships like drunkards reel and tumble side to side. But to conclude, such was the will of heaven and the true spirit of that gentleman that being thought hopeless to be preserved, Yet in Moore's spite and all the Spaniards scoff, he brought his ship and soldiers bravely off. War's spite indeed, and we can do him right. The ship he sailed in, fought in, call War's spite. Now, noble soldiers, rouse your hearts like men to noble resolution. If any here there be that loves us not or harbor fear, we give him liberty to leave our camp without displeasure. Mm. Our armies royal, so be equal our hearts. For with the meanest he here, for with the meanest here he spends <clears throat> my blood. Sorry, for with the meanest here I'll spend my blood, and so to lose it count my only good. A march, lead on will meet the worst can fall. A maiden queen will be your general. And they march one way out. At the other door, enter Sir Francis Drake with colours and ensigns taken from the Spaniards. What mean these Spanish ensigns in the hands of English subjects? Honourable queen, they show that Spaniards' lives are in the hands of England's sovereign. England's, God be praised. But prithee, Drake, for well I know thy name, and I'll not be unmindful of thy worth. Briefly rehearse the danger of the battle, till Furbisher was rescued, we have heard. The danger after that was worse than then. Valor on both sides strove to rise with honor, as is a 
pair of balance, once made even, so stood the day, inclined to neither side. Sometimes we yielded, but like a ram that makes returnment to redouble strength, then forced them to them to yield. When our Lord Admiral, following the chase, Pedro, their admiral, with many knights and captains of account, were by his noble deeds taken prisoner, and under his conducts are safely kept, and are by this time landed at St. Margaret's, and whence they from whence they mean to march along by land. And at St. James, he'll greet your majesty. These Spanish ensigns, token of our conquest, our captains took from their battered ships, such as stood out, we sunk. Uh, as such as submitted, tasted our England, our English mercy and survive, vassals and prisoners to your sovereignty. England's God be praised. But privy I've said this speech. Yeah, and I've got a, a whole speech that's just Yeah, I think the rest of this twice. page is, is the same. This is, this is my cock up. Mm. Well, it's, that, it's, it's, it's always an editorial process, so um, that, that's uh, just skip to your next speech then, please, Queen. Next under God, yeah? Yeah, because everything yeah. else seems to be exactly yeah. the same. Yeah. Next under God, your valours have the praise. Dismiss our camp and tread a royal march towards St. James, where in martial order we'll meet and parley our Lord Admiral and set a ransom of his prisoners. As for those ensigns, see them safely kept and give commandment to the Dean of Paul's. I'll not for, he'll not for, he not forget in his next learned sermon to celebrate this conquest at Paul's cross. And to the audience in our name declare our thanks to heaven in universal prayer. For though our enemies be overthrown, it is by the hand of heaven and not our own. On, sound a call. Now, loving countrymen, subjects and fellow soldiers that have left your weeping wives, your goods and children, and laid your lives upon the edge of death for good of England and Elizabeth, we thank you all. Those that for us would bleed shall find us kind to them and to their seed. We here dismiss you and dismiss our camp. Again, we thank you. Pleaseth God we live a greater recompense than thanks we'll give. Our lives, lives and our lives and livings, livings for, Elizabeth. for Elizabeth. Thanks, general thanks. Towards London march we to a peaceful throne. We wish no wars, yet we must guard our own. And they exit, and there is an epilogue. The princess, young Elizabeth, ye seen in her minority, and since a queen, a subject and a sovereign in the one, a pitied lady in the royal throne, a potent queen, it now in you doth rest to know in which she hath demeaned her best. Yes. Uh, okay, so um, we will go through much of that again in similar but slightly different fashion um yeah um that's the end of one version of the play um you know we won yay um i i don't know what happened to hobson i don't know if timothy is alive um i i i don't know really what's happening with john um but the spanish armada happened <laughs> it's like there are all these plot holes just 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 dang it's like it's yeah it's like that there was another there there was an equivalent number of pages to this script uh that finished off the rest of the play and it's just like now nah, let's just have let's just have the armada and it just went and just plonked this stuff in. Really weird. Really <laughs> weird. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Eric. 
it's almost like someone's kind of gone, well, you know, this scene with Hobson, he's very funny. I love him, but you know, we gotta cut him. He's not he's not getting enough laughs, not enough bums on seats. They have all come to see the queen, and you know, they have to cut him. Have they? I mean, seriously, I mean, the, this play has so know. little queen action. It, it it does feel like this is a coda to the last play, but it doesn't feel like it's got anything to do with this play at all. <laughs> Especially that sort of really Humpty Dumpty epilogue at the end, um, which does feel like it's 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 addressing something else. It's very odd, very odd. Uh, I did quite like bits of it. I mean, it's, 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 you know, again, it's a perfectly efficient scene in its own fashion. We've had lots of other scenes doing similar kinds of work in different uh, history plays. Um, Queen's speech is quite good, quite nice. There's some interesting stuff going on there. Some uh, weird stuff as well, but yeah. Uh, thoughts on the room. Um, we're going to do this again in, with, with, in, in, in variations in a moment. Uh, Lois, you're muted at the moment. Uh, anybody else got any thoughts while oh, here ah, Lois go. is here? Yeah, <laughs> not that it was worth waiting for. But anyway, um, yeah, that epilogue, uh, I mean, it finishes up by asking which, you know, did you like part one or part two better, I think. And uh, that must mean that they'd done the two plays together. Uh, and uh, but I don't see how the audience could show that anyway, except I suppose if they applauded part one, they can now applaud part two even more. Is there is there is there more to a part two that you know that there was another part and things mm. things happen strange in the edit? Um, yeah, I mean I, the 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 play that immediately leaps to mind or plays that leap to mind the Robin Hood plays in the sense that you know something mm. strange editorially happens yeah. there, um, yeah. and it, it's as I said this before you know sometimes things just happen to plays when they're in rep that you just do stuff and it sort of works and it sort of works for that production and mm. that that company. Uh, even if it doesn't on paper make any sense, if the show works, then that's cool. And I kind of feel that there's something like that has happened here. But I could be wrong. Um, yeah. Uh, should we like to read version two? <laughs> to get deja vu all over again. Uh, I'll ask uh, Lois if you could read post number three, who is effectively the same as uh, yeah. as the captain that you read. Um, <laughs> we're going to rejoin the scene at the point of uh, greatest diversion. So uh, everybody sort of wandered on and says, uh, we're going to be terribly, terribly brave, but hopefully everything's going well at sea. Uh, and then there's a peal of shot uh, within. A peal of shot within. And the Queen asks this question. Hang on a second, I'm in the wrong play. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> Whence came this sound of shot? It seems the Navy, styled by the Pope the Navy, invincible, riding along the coast of France in Dunkirk, discovered first by Captain Thomas Fleming, is met and fought with by your Admiral. Heaven prosper their defence. Oh, had God made us manlike like our mind. We had not been here fenced in a muir of arms, but had been present at this these sea alarms. There's a horn. <laughs> Enter the first post. Make way there. What's the news? Heaven bless your majesty. Your royal fleet bids battle to the Spaniard, whose number with advantage of the wind gains them great odds. But the undaunted worth and well-known valour of your Admiral, Sir Francis Drake, and Martin Furbisher, John Hawkins, and your other English captains, takes not away all hope of victory. Canst thou describe the manner of the fight and where the Royal Navy is first encountered? From Dover Cliff we might discern them join, twixt that and Callis. There the fight begun. Sir Francis Drake, Vice Admiral, was first, gave an onset to this great armado of Spain, the manner thus. With 25 sail, those ships of no great burden, yet well manned, for in that dreadful conflict, few or none of your ships royal came within the fight. This Drake, I say, whose memory shall live while this great world he compassed first, shall last, gave order that this his squadrons, one by one, should follow him some distance, 
steers his course, but none to shoot till he himself gave fire. Forward he steered, as far before the rest as a good musket can well bear it twice. <coughs> and as a spy comes to survey their fleet, which seemed like a huge city built on the sea, they shot and shot and emptied their broadsides at his poor single vessel. He sails on. Yet all this while, no fire was seen from him. The rest behind, longing for action, thought he had been turned coward that had done all this for their more safety. He now finding most of their present fury spent at him, fires a whole tire at once. And having emptied a full broadside, the rest came up to him and did the like undaunted. Scarce the last had passed them, but Drake had cleared the sea. For ere the unwieldy, unwieldy vessels could be stirred, or their late emptied ordnance charged again, he takes advantage both of wind and tide, and the same course he took in his progress, doth in his back return keep the same order, the same order, scouring along as if he would besiege them with a new wall of fire in all his squadrons, leaving no charge that was not bravely manned insomuch that blood as visibly was seen to pour out of their portholes, portholes, in such manner as after showers in the city spout spill rain, and thus Drake bade them welcome what after happened, such as a huge cloud of smoke in Virindus, we could not well discover. There's for thy speed, and England ne'er wants such a Drake at need. Enter a second post. Thou art welcome. What canst thou relate touching this naval conflict? Since Drake's first onset and our fleet retired, the Spanish Navy being linked and chained like a half moon or to a full bent bow attend advantage, where amongst the rest, Sir Martin Furbisher, blinded with smoke by chance, is fallen into the midst of them still fighting against extremity of odds, where he, with all his gallant followers, are folded in death's arms. If he survive, he shall be nobly ransomed. If he be dead, yet he shall live in immortality. How fares our admiral? Bravely he directs, and with much judgment England never bred men that in a sea fight better managed. It cheers my blood, and if so, heaven be pleased for some neglected duty in ourselves to punish us with loss of these brave spirits, his will be done. Yet will we pray for them. What says valiant Lester? Thou wilt not leave us, wilt thou? Looks thou pale? What says old Hunston? Nay, I'll speak thy part. Thy hand, O Lord. I'm sure I have thy heart. Both hand and heart. Enter the third post. Before thou speaks, take that. If he be dead, ourself will see his funeral honoured. I then proceed thus. When the great galleons and galleuses had environed them, the undaunted Furbisher, the round beset, cheered up his soldiers and well manned his fights and standing barehead bravely on the deck when murdering shot as thick as april's hail swung by his ears he waved his warlike sword firing at once his tires on either side with su such a fury that he brake their chains shattered their decks and made their stoutest ships like drunkards reel and tumble side to side thus in war's spite and all the spaniards scoff he brought both ship and soldiers bravely off. War's spite indeed, and we to do him right will call the ship he fought in, the war's spite. Now, countrymen, shall our spirits here on land come short of theirs, so much admired at sea? If there be any here that harbour fear, we give them liberty to leave the camp and thank them for their absence. A march. Lead on, we'll meet the worst can fall. A maiden queen is now your general. 
a march within. As they march about the flag, Sir Francis Drake and Sir Martin Furbisher meet them with Spanish ensigns in their hands and drum and colours before them. What mean these Spanish ensigns in the hands of English subjects? Gracious Queen, they show that Spaniards' lives are in the hands of England's sovereign. England's God be praised. But prithee, Drake, for well I know thy name, nor will I be unmindful of thy worth. Briefly rehearse the danger of the battle. Till Furbisher was rescued, we have heard. We then retired, and after council called, we stuffed eight empty hoys with pitch and oil and all the ingredients apt to take fire, and sent them with where their proud armada lay. The Spaniard, now at anchor, thought we had come for parley and so rode secure. But when they beheld them flame, like to so many bright bonfires, making their fleet and Etna like themselves, they cut their cables, let their anchors sink, burying at once more wealth within the sea than the Indies can in many years restore. Now, their high built and large capacious bottoms being by this means unaccommodated like to so many rough unbridled steeds command themselves or rather are commanded and hurried where the inconstant winds shall please some fell on quicksands other break on shelves medina with their grand and their great grand and general we left unto the mercy of the sea Don Pedro, their high admiral, we took with many knights and noblemen of Spain who are by this time landed at St. Margaret's from whence your admiral brings them up by land and at St. James means to greet your grace. Next under heaven, your valors have the praise. But prithee Drake, give us a brief relation of those ships that in this exhibition expedition were employed against the Spanish forces. The Elizabeth Jonas, Triumph, the White Bear, the Mare Honora, and the Victory. Ark Raleigh, Du Repulse, Garland, War Spite, the Mary Rose, the Bonadventure Hope, the Lion, Rainbow, Vanguard, Nonpareil, Dreadnought, Defiance, Swift Shore, Antelope, the Whale, the Scout, Arcades, the Revenge. Drake no more. Whatever this navy shall he hereafter sail, Oh, may it with no less success prevail. Dismiss our camp and tread a royal march towards St. James, where in martial order we'll meet and parley our Lord Admiral. As for those ensigns, let them be safely kept and give commandment to the Dean of Paul's. He not forget in his next learned sermon to celebrate this conquest at Paul's cross and to the audience in our name declare our thanks to heaven in universal prayer. For though our enemies be overthrown, tis by the hand of heaven and not our own. On, sound a call. A call is sounded. Now loving countrymen and fellow soldiers merited thanks to all, we here dismiss you and dissolve our camp. Long, long live, live, long live, 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 Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Thanks, General. Thanks. Toward London, march me to a peaceful throne. We wish no wars, yet we must guard our own. And they exit, led by General Thanks, um, uh, <laughs> whose martial deeds are known throughout the land. Uh, Rachel, uh, do you want to leap straight in? Uh, I was just going to comment again on the character of Elizabeth, that um, uh, her demeanor of, uh, or at least her mask of, um, the way that the way that she works with people, you can see even in this language when she c talks to her subjects that she makes uh, the one guy that she was talking to before, or I forget who it was because I, I, I noticed it the first time we went over the alternate scene of this that um you know sh she mentions how he, he should be suspect uh but he's done good that she uh, raises people up and also censures them at the same time to keep them in a certain place in a certain state of wariness 
and to not uh, give the appearance of too much favor for anybody to come ask her for anything. And then this, uh, her thanks, general thanks, uh, you know, it seems like the, I don't know, it's just so interesting the way that she uh, uses language in regards to other people to maintain um, the rank of things. Mm. Uh, Lois. Yeah, that is very strange, that bit about Sir Anthony at the uh, the beginning that, uh, I mean, he comes on for two lines saying how loyal he is to the Queen, and he appears to be, since we don't hear about his doing anything awful. I mean, it's, it obviously balances the Perry episode and the, 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 you know, the treatment of Catholics earlier on. You know, there are some good Catholics who are loyal to the Queen. Uh, Helen. Yes, I mean, the, the, the thing is that nobody has the slightest idea what would have happened if Spain had landed. Um, I mean, all the Catholics, uh, it, it, it's a bit like the, the uh, 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 potential German invasion um, at the beginning of World War II. There are, were an awful lot of fascists in England and they all never actually got a chance to prove things either way. Um, but we 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 don't know and there was always this tremendous suspicion that all the catholics would immediately have risen up on the, on the side of spain but here we're seeing that here is a loyal catholic gentleman who is putting his everything he has at the disposal of the government to repel spain which is uh, on the whole a good thing though there were englishmen actually on the armada um, so it's interesting with the two scenes, uh, you know, both of which have their merits, neither of which I think quite works entirely by themselves. Um, we've got some speeches that don't quite flow into each other, but we have that with both versions. I mean, it's not like there's a sort of better version. There's there's mm -hmm. some bits that flow better than others. I mean, the first post in the, the first version uh, has basically very little to say. The second one doesn't half go on. Um, it's this massive speech. Um, we get uh, you know, variations. Um, we get a list of ships in the second version. I, 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 I kind of quite liked that one, actually. I, I, I'm averse to some of these ships. You know, it's like earlier we had, let's name all these old, uh, you know, mayors and noble mm. figures. I, you know, I, I, I can live with a bit of ship ship listing. Uh, uh, though, obviously, you don't want a ship to list. That would be awful. Lynn, then Alan <laughs> and Eric. One thing I liked about this um the, the second version was the level of, of detail about the battle itself, the the description of the fire ships, which evidently did happen, um, the names of the ships. The, so just you, you hear more about what actually happened in the sea battles. And I, I kind of like that. Mm. Uh, Alan. I think we had a suggestion that parts of this play may have been paid for by Gresham or the Gresham oh. family. And I do just wonder whether with the uh, second uh, ending that we've just read, whether he was also collecting money off families of those who uh, got honourable mentions for their actions during the Armada. Uh, Eric. Um, I was going to say the list of ships is probably stolen from like, you know, um, Homer or something, or, yeah. you know, translations of Ovid. Um, but um, the... I mean, the idea. Um, but also, I'm just wondering, sort of, like, at the time, what would have been going on uh, socially? Like, sort of, were they getting ready for war? Is that the point? Because, obviously, I think it was Helen who said this in a previous session ages ago about, like, how during times of peace, there's plays about war. But, obviously, this is much more... Di this seems much more target... The second version seems much more targeted compared to the first one. Uh, Lois... Yeah, we'd need to look at the dates of the different performances or the, di the different editions and see um, what, what they, they uh, sort of line up with. And you know, my feeling about that list of ships is just I feel sorry for the actor who has to learn all that. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of a feat of memory when she says, OK, could you just tell us what the ships were? <laughs> oh, it's only, what, seven lines? Yeah. Ah, that's that's oh. easy. That's easy. Yeah. And you can always make a few up. It's not like anyone's going to know. <laughs> um, <laughs> Helen. 
<laughs> well, said. I don't know because every single one of those names is probably, I mean, the Navy is very conservative about its naming. So mm. in in the times subsequently, they've all, they were all, um, they've all been well used. Mm. And in fact, the Ark Raleigh, uh, I mean, she's talking about renaming the War Spike, but the big renaming was the Ark Raleigh, which was renamed the Ark Royal. Mm. <laughs> And then became, you know, there's always been an Ark Royal yeah. ever since. And, you know, Defiance and, you know, Revenge and Hope. And, you know, yeah. there, there's, there's some good, like, memorable names in there, actually. Yeah. That, 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 that oh, actually, for once, Rose. is not... Sorry, uh, yeah. The Mary Rose, that's presumably the Mary Rose, the one that sunk? No. No. No, <laughs> no, no it had sunk. <laughs> oh, it had already sunk. This is a new yeah. Mary Rose. Yes, I mean, I know that there were in the fleet at least two Elizabeth Jonases. I mean, there, mm. there are an awful lot of ships. They, they, there weren't that many ship names around. <laughs> and um, so the, the, the hull ship, uh, there was a hull Elizabeth Jonas and uh, there was a... I mean, all the, the local ports sent ships. They weren't of any use, but they sent them. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we we have all the material now. And I'm, I really am going to sort of throw us in that, that, that question of actually what do you do with material with this, you know, the, the, these plays. We've got alternate versions. Um, and very much the ending of this play is where alterations seem to be happening uh where you know the chorus that we've had the scene with the uh the, on the spanish side uh sort of uh, our later appearances um as well as variations in the end so it feels like the ending is a very much a a uh, uh, certainly has undergone an awful lot of change uh, during its, its life. I don't want to go too much into uh, precisely how that or why that happens, but what it leaves us with is a real sense of, OK, we have license to do stuff to this play, to <laughs> to make it all, all hang together, you know. Um, and at the moment, I have to say my thoughts are is that we've got an Elizabeth play that we did last time, and we've now, we've now got some material for a nice little coda that you might just use some of the material through just to do the best bits to say that Elizabeth, who we thought was perhaps, you know, hadn't grown into a role. Here's a little flash forward to what she's going to be like. Uh, five minute closing number uh, for a show, uh, which actually sort of underruns actually that first part. It's very short. Um, so there's room to actually put this some of this material there and actually rework the rest of the play to be a more effective city comedy um, of which there are gaps in which I think we might have to write some material to make it all hang together I don't think it's quite we can do it with scissors I don't think we can quite make it all work I think Hans, um, Hobson needs a, needs a final scene and we need to know what happens to Timothy properly yeah. and we need to know we need John to have some kind of come up and surely. <laughs> um, but anyway, I've spoken enough. Let's just sort of throw it around the room. Thoughts, uh, Alan, then Lynn. I must admit, what we've done today, I would be inclined to ditch that sequence with um, John uh, completely because I, I don't think that really did anything useful. The rest of it, which is basically the Armada story, would work quite well, I think, as an appendage to the play we did last week, the part one, mm. uh, because you're getting effectively the story of, it, story of Elizabeth with a, a gap of 30 years, but we've had plays that have had equally howling gaps. Um, but that would seem to fit together much better as a unit than the what we've done over the last, the previous three days to which this is only really tangentially connected. Yeah, I mean, it's that question of whether we can move some of that John material, because that John material does sort of match the other John material earlier in the play. It's just whether you can crowbar it in. Because it feels like the Queen opening the Royal Exchange seems like where the play should end. Yeah. And then you should bring in the hang the person who's supposed to be hanged, petition from Hobson, hi Bess, how are you doing? Um, 
it's just to make that work requires more more than just editorial snipping mm -hmm. it does feel like you need to actually hand it to a playwright to just tidy up those edges because we've got lots of material we might want to cut from earlier in the play as well where we were saying it's a bit much mm -hmm. uh, and try and decide what the play is trying to do because I think we can get distracted by that I think the Queen Elizabeth problem is the much easier problem to solve in a weird way mm -hmm. uh, Lynn then Helen yeah I, I agree basically with both Rob and Alan that that yeah the, the 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 thing my my impulse would be to take the elizabeth stuff out of this play and interleave it somehow with the previous play um and then try to build a city comedy out of what's left with perhaps just like the cameo of the queen opening the royal exchange because yeah. that doesn't seem to to relate um but that's not going to be easy because you know as rob says you're going to have to add some stuff to kind of give your audience a sense of a, an ending to the Hobson thread, an ending to the Timothy thread, an end, a, a, you know, closure to the to to John's story, and that's that's actually quite tough. The the language in this uh, play is not super difficult, but writing verse uh, passes for early modern is not that easy. I mean, I've done a little bit of it, but no more than like six or eight lines. Uh, and I was pretty satisfied with the result, but like writing whole scenes and making it sound like the same kind of uh, of verse and prose, that's that's actually really quite difficult. Mm, it's a similar problem, you know, we've got with Woodstock is that Woodstock, you know, ends and, you know, you've got to decide what you're going to do with the close yeah. of that play. Um, and yeah, the, the, the idea of doing faux, um, uh, you know, blank verse is just always a bit of a um <laughs> helen then lois uh one little thing uh hunston who appears mm -hmm. briefly in the armada re re relation uh is the same guy who brought the news that qu the queen was queen mm. so that's a that's another call back um, a great little symmetry there. I... Yeah, well, I, 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 it just suddenly occurred to me. Um, the other thing is you've got to decide what to do about Parry, Doctor Parry, yeah. and the assassination. It, now you can you can get rid of it altogether, but I would say that if it belongs in the Elizabeth play and not mm. the Gresham play, mm. it uh, it. Oh, yes, yes. No, I think that's true. I mean, I, I have to say that it, it does feel like it could end up being a casualty of the, the of you know, it's it's a nice scene, but it's very difficult to feel mm. that you can you can sensibly put it anywhere. Mm. Um, but, you know, who knows? We should try it. I definitely think we could we could always record it in isolation and do a special thing on it. And uh, we're again talking across with other mediums. Maybe it's all fine. Maybe if you do it as a long flowing stream of stuff that it all works. I, I just don't know that it does. Uh, Lois, then Alan. Yeah. Uh, isn't Hunsdon the Lord Chamberlain as well? I mean, I'm, I'm not sure because the, the, the type, the, the, the job moved around a bit, but Hun, uh, A. Hunsdon was Lord Chamberlain anyway, which meant that he was the, you know, in charge of the whole acting world. Uh, but, uh, and, and particularly, of course, of Lord Chamberlain's men. Uh, the, yeah, what I was actually thinking of was um, dumb show. Uh, and in fact, one could one could have a kind of quick dumb show of Perry being executed, followed by one of Timothy mounting the scaffold and uh, uh, a Hobbs, Hobson riding madly in. And you could do the whole thing pretty much in dumb show. You could even, I think, deal with John that way, given that he's the one uh, responsible for this mess, uh, if you wanted to. Uh, but uh, I don't know, because the I mean, the other way to do it would be, in fact, to play the whole of that scene between John and Lady Ramsay and then have him turn up at the end and, you know, incredibly soberly dressed and perhaps even behaving like a Puritan and, you know, just send up the whole uh, repentance thing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if it was a film, you could almost have, um, you know, it goes to black slide photograph and uh, 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 John uh, 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 Hobson went on to do X um, and you just <laughs> yes. get a little little slideshow of, of what they did next yeah. um, with, as sentimental music plays. And, uh, you know, Queen Elizabeth went on to do... Uh, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I only 
slightly joking. Uh, Alan? Yeah, I was just thinking, actually, that if one actually reordered slightly, put the parry scene after the chorus, which would, I think, act as a good bridging point from part one into the rest of the Elizabeth story, it wouldn't actually jar too much to have that chorus speech preceding the parry episode. Um, and the personnel remain fairly constant because Lester's there as well. That could actually work thematically, I think. Or, or maybe split the chorus in two so you use it uh, initially and then because the, the, mm. the second half of that chorus is very and now we're going to go out and talk to some our, our, our uh, foreign correspondents. Um, mm. uh, so yeah, there might be a thing to work there. I just wonder whether, as a coder, you you don't want it to get too top heavy if you're doing it as one part of a single show. Um, but that's a flow thing that you can figure out in rehearsals. Yeah, but I I can't remember how much we thought ought to be uh, blue penciled out from part one. Not a um, lot. It wasn't not a long an play. There was there weren't massive chunks of it. I remember that. But I think we were thinking that there could be a few light cuts. Hmm which could bring the combined effort down to a manageable size. Oh, it, uh, no, I, it, it's not a problem of length. It's a matter of structure. It's mm. just if, if you end up with an overlong coda at the end, yeah. then it will feel un, untidy. Um, it isn't a coda. It's mm. the next scene. Mm. It I'm just happens to be 30 years later. I, I, oh. I'm not sure that uh, if you watch, if you put part one and then that material in afterwards, that it would feel that way uh, in a um. show. I, 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 that's my instinct. I could be wrong, I, I, and I, I think it's something actually. It's a very straightforward thing for us to workshop in in a, in a Zoom setting to just say, let's put this material end to end and just see how it flows and see if it feels weird. And if it doesn't feel weird, then that's our answer. Um, uh, Lois, then Rachel, then Eric. Yeah, I was just thinking of another thing, which is that the play apparently ends with the sort of grand procession of everybody uh, celebrating, presumably carrying the Spanish flags and everything. It would be quite easy to bring in any member of the cast that we haven't wound up with, you know, just get them in this procession and, uh, uh, you know, doing something that would indicate how their story ended. Mm. Um, uh... Exit Queen Elizabeth followed by Hobson, Jack, <laughs> Gresham. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Timothy. I mean, yeah, yeah, all Timothy. Are, all, yeah, all, all friends again. Yeah, mm. I mean, you, yeah. Could, you could easily get them in, and you know, just bits of business that would sort of tell you what had happened. Yeah, Lady Ramsay cheering on the side. Mm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and John uh, all soberly dressed and uh, probably turning beggars away and so mm, on. Mm. Yeah, uh, Rachel. Uh, it, to what Helen was saying in the putting them together as it, it being more more than a coda, I think if we put them together in a Zoom thing to see how it would flow, even if it felt weird, it might still work because she's uh, the way she you know juggles the people in this this play is similar to how she was juggling with people in the last play. But also you have a, a wonderful stark contrast between her position, you know, um, and, you know, how uh, some people were feeling that she was more reactionary in the first one. And we don't have that idea that we have now of Elizabeth. And in this one, I feel like we really got that idea that we have. And you get this uh, real contrast and transformation over that span of time and um, the same way that this focus on Gresham and those buildings is kind of like that build up to getting Elizabeth and having her come up on stage. It, it could potentially build up to seeing the Elizabeth that we want to see on stage, you know, her in her most uh, empowered state, you know, because the first one kind of, uh, I mean, if, if, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, and we live in a world where this is now history, but, uh, the likelihood of both her siblings passing away and the crown going to her um, is tremendously probably small that they weren't thinking about it. Uh, Eric, then Lynn. See, I was going to be, well, not radical, but anyway, I, aside from like the Elizabeth stuff, I was going to cut this, like, you know, 
part two, whatever, um, at the point where Hobson rides off to save um, Timothy <laughs> and then just, you know, use whatever we've got. Because Hobson doesn't reappear after that. So, nope. you know, you can just like write a whole new play based on Hobson if you really want to. <laughs> um, and, you know, then tie up the loose ends with John and so on and so forth. Because, you know, it, it, but, and use like, you know, the Ram Lady Ramsey scene as well. Because there, that there is no interaction between that and the rest of the play, mm. aside from maybe when they meet Queen Elizabeth. Yeah, I, that was my thinking: was that somehow if we could somehow make the timing work, uh, and it's structurally very difficult to do this, but if you could move that later material before the opening of the Royal Exchange, and then uh, so that the we can almost have an integrated action. He gets on the horse, he rides, and he's coming to the Queen, and part of what he does is actually to say, look, let us... And the Queen gets to solve all the problems. <laughs> That's quite, you know, it's yeah. de deus, uh, you know, uh, or queenus ex machina. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, um, and, and, uh, and that sort of feels quite fun. And that may, uh, that, that would be... Uh, but it, it's just looking at it, it's going to be quite difficult to make work um not so much because you have to write additional material but just actually trying to squeeze all the various plot threads from earlier into the right order so that they make sense which already is the play doesn't quite make sense there's a few bits where we're going hang on how does that work so somewhere somewhere there are bits that need to be cut uh or moved around uh so it would be a relatively radical reworking on a paper level i don't think in terms of theme and the way it would all flow it would actually be that bad um uh i saw lots of other hands i said lynn then elizabeth yeah i want to skip back to um what rachel was saying about elizabeth and how there's kind of both um or what you would look for is transformation growth but yet a, a kind of continuity in her character uh that that she's, you know, the the humble Elizabeth who's a subject and the grand Elizabeth who's queen. Maybe we don't have to choose. It would it be a really great exercise to see if you can create that character and, and make her look like a one person. And, and one thing that does kind of tie her together is she is a master of using language. That uh, when she's having her little interaction with her jailer, at, uh, you know, please stop bringing up my commission or no, it, no, he's like insisting on his commission. And it's like, if you've got a commission, you're my jailer. So, so she, she kind of uses his language against him. And um, um, and in her interactions with the, the with Mary and Mary's agents, I will sub, I'll submit as a subject, but I won't do it in a way that implies I'm guilty of anything. The way she plays with 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 the you know strict meaning of language and uses that to her advantage is really very smart and then she's very articulate and uh and uh, and authoritative uh as as queen so i think it'd be really great if you could uh do an elizabeth play and you know, put the armada thing at the end even though it's 30 years later and and try to make that seem like one aesthetic unit and this idea that that elizabeth is always master of the situation because she's always master of how she expresses herself in in language mm. uh, elizabeth then lois yeah i was just thinking that for me i think this might be the millennials in me is that <laughs> i want a trilogy like that, <laughs> that it shouldn't be two parts it should be three and we should we should because because i think if you know not me part two is very long it just felt, it felt, I don't know if it was very long, but it felt very long. And it felt definitely in two parts. Um, and if you know Not Me Part One, that felt that some of the ending of that felt like it could go on another play. So I was there thinking, is there any way we can kind of shoehorn it into three plays? <laughs> well, in, a sen in a sense, we've, we, we, we've sort of, split it into three plays but we're talking about trying to take one of the splits and pull it on another play um but yeah i, th I think you're absolutely right that it, it does feel like we've got three different units of action going on here um you know we could just take the material from here that's queen elizabethy and expand it i i'd like more philip 
I, I, I know, and I, 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 I think we can we can enjoy having Philip back in again. I think there should be could, could be some fun scenes there. Um, you know, uh, Kate Blanchett only managed to, two films, but you know, there's still time uh, <laughs> for a trilogy. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, Lois, I think. Yeah, I think this would almost work rather well as a Zoom play with with plenty of slides in it. I mean, when when we hear about the Royal Exchange, why not have a picture of the Royal Exchange? You know, I mean, this is the sort of thing that the audience would have felt. They, they all knew exactly where the Royal Exchange was and what it looked like. But uh, a lot of our hypothetical audience won't. And one could treat it more as a kind of... Uh, uh, sort of as Haywood intended it, I think, you know, partly patriotic, partly history lesson, partly just good fun. And uh, with, you know, with such a, a mixed collection of scenes and just do the thing really like a, like a TV series and whatever number of episodes it takes, but using quite a lot of projections and captions and things. Mm. Um, right. Well, um, we've, we've already discussed it uh, quite thoroughly, um, but I will go around the room for final thoughts. Uh, if you have different final thoughts, if you just want to say the same thing again, you know, just 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 move on. Um, yeah, uh, it's it's uh, it's quite a three pipe problem. Uh, this one, I, I it, it brings out the dramaturgist in me uh, of going, oh, this this is an interesting project. Um, but it is one of those plays where you're going, OK, there's a lot of good here. But there's also just a lot of, a lot, a lot uh, to, to deal with. So uh, any final thoughts from the room? Uh, Rachel, do you have anything to add? Um, no, I, I, I found, uh, yeah, yes, a little bit. Yes, uh, the, I, I did feel what Lois just said, that it's uh, very interesting to me, the parts with Gresham about the history. Um, I've tried so hard not to compare it to uh, the other play, but just on its own, I do wish I had more uh, Elizabeth, and more scenes um, with her, because that same character that was articulated in um, the other play you see it there again but now she's in this she's in this different place and that she, she's just a wonderful character to to have on um, um i think play with so i would have liked to see more of her uh more queen uh from rachel eric uh do, do you want uh, more hobson uh or yeah, other final uh, thoughts yeah i mean like sort of there's a problem going more Hobson and more Queen but like not in the same play necessarily just sort of just, you know the more plays the better the more I don't know the more fun we're gonna have um then again I, I think you could have like it because the the Queen meeting Hobson just feels like a sort of I don't know alternate universe episode where they both cross kind of thing and then they just never meet again <laughs> Nobody mentions it ever more. Uh, Alan, any final thoughts? I don't think I've got a lot to add to what we've already shared. Thank you. Cool. Uh, Lois, any final thoughts? Mm, I don't know. My only feeling was that that last scene is actually rather boring. I mean, there are just so many narratives of battles and so on. And uh, uh, I would have thought cut like mad, but uh, uh, because you can't really count on an audience wanting to hear every glorious detail of this wonderful victory, that, you know, the way maybe Haywood could. <laughs> Mm, yeah um and yeah i mean that's part of the reason why i'm thinking of it more as a coda in the sense that it would be quite short uh oh. a shortened version rather than playing all the scenes for their their maximum value uh it, it would be the emphasis on as rachel's point was making the queen's journey seem more mm. apparent with some of her wonderful speechifying Mm -hmm. um as opposed to here are some noble people saying stuff that happened off stage mm -hmm. uh which yeah and again one of the slides things i was thinking of was that during even that rather short chorus bit one could have uh various uh portraits of elizabeth you know from the young woman up to the older woman just superimposed quickly and that would provide yes. a visual equivalent with the passage of time mm. uh lynn any final thoughts uh no i you know what the 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 last comment I made pretty much sums it up. So, cool, uh, Helen. Any any more for any more? Uh, I would like to do to divide it into two plays: an Elizabeth play and a Gresham Hobson play, <laughs> and uh, do them as second looks, mm. uh, and just see what bits work and what bits don't. Mm. Mm. Um, 
yeah, no, I'm 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 good for that. With the, the, there's a sort of question of editorial. The, a number of editorial decisions would need to be made in advance, but I don't see a reason why we can't we can't uh, come up with uh, something that we can we can run with. I'm 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 all for that. Yeah. Um, uh, Elizabeth, any final thoughts? Yeah, it kind of reminded me of The Crown because in season one and two you have Claire Foy as the queen and then suddenly you have in season three and four Olivia Colman as the queen and I was wondering like that, that it's jarring that this that, that when we get to if you know not me part two we only see like a much older version of Elizabeth I kind of wanted to see something from the middle ground but instead we got yeah. the chorus explaining to us what had happened in the interim so i think i really enjoyed if you know not me i enjoyed part one and i enjoyed part two i think the city comedy is quite um engaging in itself but that the real excitement comes when the queen comes back Mm. Uh, so it looks like the general tenor of the room is that we're quite interested in doing a, a, a play, uh, The Troubles of Queen Elizabeth Incorporating the Famous Victory. Uh, and if you know not me, you know nobody with no number at all because it is a singular play on it, in of its own right. Um, all that remains is to thank all the wonderful readers uh, across the week as well as today. Thank you very much, everyone. And goodbye. Mm.